from Built It Productions, it's The Great Creators. Conversations about creativity with some of the most celebrated actors, musicians, and performers of our time. I'm Guy Raz, and today on the show, a master comic gives a master class on learning to become himself. Giving in to me being enough on stage was a very difficult thing for a guy who could not jam enough jokes into a single sentence. How Stephen Colbert had to break character to become a better one. Stephen Colbert is a very funny man. He's up there with the greatest American humorists. But what's amazing about his career is that he's managed to be funny in remarkably different ways. He's played an unhinged high school teacher in Strangers with Candy, a blowhard cable news pundit in The Colbert Report, and now on The Late Show, well, Stephen Colbert is exactly who he is. But to get there, to learn how to be compassionate and attentive and funny and entertaining every single night on network television, as he does on The Late Show, was hard won. In this episode of The Great Creators, you're going to learn how Stephen Colbert used the tools of improv to hone his craft, how actors Amy Sedaris and Paul Donello literally broke him one night on stage, and how that changed his life, how he came up with his character on The Colbert Report, and how he got through a very painful first year as host of The Late Show, and eventually turned it into the number one late night program on television. That's all coming up after this quick break. Hey, before we get back to the show, just a quick announcement. If you're listening in the car or on a smart speaker and you have young kids in range, just a heads up that there are a few swear words in this episode in case you want to listen later with headphones or without the kids nearby. But I definitely hope you keep listening either way. Okay, thanks so much and on with the show. Stephen Colbert grew up just outside of Charleston, South Carolina, the youngest of 11 children. His family pronounced their last name Colbert, the Irish way. But Stephen's dad told the kids it was up to them how they wanted to pronounce it. So right before he headed off to college, Stephen Colbert decided to become Stephen Colbert. And it was in college at Northwestern in Chicago that Stephen started to seriously think about pursuing some type of career in entertainment. At first, though, he shied away from doing comedy. I secretly really wanted to be a comedian. Hmm. Okay. From when I was a kid, when I would listen to George Carlin and Bill Cosby albums and later Steve Martin. But I don't know, how do you do that? How do you become a comedian? There's no path that I could imagine. I couldn't see any way to do it. But I I was interested in performing. I was interested in doing plays and that sort of thing, doing theater. And there's a path for that. You go to theater school. Yeah. You don't really go to comedy school. You know, you go to theater school. And so I studied theater at Northwestern University. And the goal was to, I had had in my mind that I was going to be doing sort of street theater Shakespeare and living Mm -hmm. in this a loft with a bubbling samovar of tea and with a futon on the floor and (laughs) long hair and doing a lot of yoga. I don't know, slightly like cult, like, you know, theater commune was my goal. But then I did a fair amount of black box theater in Chicago, but then I I kept getting hired to do comedy. Yeah. I kept getting paid to do comedy. And that was very pleasant to be able to make rent. And I also found that I really liked the atmosphere of doing comedy. But certainly the plan right out of college after I'd studied theater for a few years was to be a straight actor. You know, one of the things that I I regret about my life is is I never did improv because I think improv is so I think it's so valuable as a as an exercise to kind of stretch your mind. And I know you kind of got into that in college. How do you think improv kind of was it sort of the beginning of building the the sort of building blocks and the skills that would kind of train you in a way of thinking? That's a big question, is how did improv uh, change your life, really, is what you're asking. Yeah. And I think it did in kind of an interesting and profound ways. I think improv is really good for people who don't have other plans or rather 
aren't good at planning because improv yeah. asks you not to plan. I didn't really have a plan for my knife. I'm not a planner. I'm not a scheduler. Mm -hmm. And I, I like working hard, but I didn't have a goal. I didn't have a, a plan for my career. And when I first saw people improvising on stage at a place called Cross Currents in Chicago, something about it resonated very deeply for me. Mm. And I thought, oh, I want to do this. And then when I learned about some of the philosophy behind it, which is acceptance and discovery as opposed to resistance and invention, you're not trying to change the world around you. You're trying to perceive it and, and make yourself part of it and add to it, which is a philosophically different thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, it helps you roll with the punches. It can get you in trouble mm -hmm. because it ends up, at least for me, and I think for some of my friends, the acceptance, the yes and of, yeah. of improvisation can bleed over into your life. Yeah. And so I would say yes to everything. Yeah. You know, whether it was in a scene or any chance at performance or, I don't know, going to the next bar. It also makes you perceive every human interaction after you do it for a while. Everything, especially when you first start doing it and first get into the idea of initiations and what information you're getting out of people when you hear somebody start a scene. Like anything they might say ends up being very informative once you get your ear tuned to what the offering is of someone starting a scene on stage, whatever they might say. And then you start hearing that in your own life and you start perceiving everything someone says to you as the possible initiation of a scene, mm -hmm. which ends up making other people really interesting to you because you perceive yourself in your daily, or at least I did, in your daily interactions with people as being as interesting as a moment of performance because the only way to perform improvisationally is to be deeply attached to what's happening in the moment. So strangely, even though the world seems very performative to you, it doesn't feel false. It feels very real and you feel very engaged, mm -hmm. which is a very roundabout way of saying that after you do it for a while, if you really get it into your bones, you naturally start to live in the moment. Mm -hmm. And so it's a really, really rich philosophical worldview, you know, if you really give into it. Yeah. And, and and improv, you, you started to sort of dabble in it in college, but you, you really got deeply into it after, I think after you graduated. You you were first at, at uh, Annoyance Theater in Chicago and then at the legendary uh, improv group Second City. And I think that's where, where you met two people um, who would be hugely important in your career, Amy Sedaris and Paul Dinello. And I read that that initially uh, Paul Danello thought you were like cold and standoffish. Yes, I don't know if he thought it. I don't, he might have just perceived the truth. I don't know if he was a, it was a false impression of me. I might have been cold and standoffish to him because I thought he was, you know, a barely literate knuckle dragger. <laughs> <laughs> Which, to defend myself, was an image he liked to project of being a bit of a street tough. When in fact, his father was clinical psychology for DePaul University. And I caught him one day when he was reading essays by Bertrand Russell. And I went, oh, this guy's not who he pretends to be. I, I wonder, like, how, how did that, I mean, that collaboration sort of became hugely significant in your in your life and career for, for all three of you. Um, yeah, I mean, it probably was like 15, 16 years where I, if, if I wasn't actually writing something with them every day, at least talk to them every day. What what was it like? How, how did the three of you? What do you remember about sort of the creative process between the three of you? I mean, did, what, was it natural? Were there things that you would say and bounce off each other, or or did it kind of evolve into that relationship? Well, Paul and Amy already knew each other. Right. They were they were actually boyfriend and girlfriend when we first started working together. And we'd all been hired on the same day, along with Chris Farley and a couple of other people wow. at Second City. We were all hired the same day. And Amy immediately was put into, there were three different companies. There was Red Co., Blue Co., and Green Co. Basically, the, 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 the touring companies of Second City were set up sort of like circuses, where they would travel around the country and try not to impede on each other's turf, if you know what I mean. And Amy was put into Blue Co, which was the company that toured the most, sort of not the best, but you know, they were, they got the best gigs. 
And it didn't surprise me at all that she was immediately put into a different company because she was so good. I don't know what Amy's moments of like discovery or ways in which Paul or certainly myself ever helped her find her voice or her skills because she came out of the box. She and Farley of that group of people had the thing where you didn't want to look away from them ever when they were on mm -hmm. stage. And I was kind of, first time I ever saw her on stage, I was actually, she was rehearsing with a different company and I was working as a waiter to try to make money at the theater. And I was cleaning the tables and doing setups for the audience that was going to come in. And I just stopped working and just watched her on stage doing a scene. And I was amazed at how funny she was with lines that I'd heard other people do. That's the thing. I had heard this material before, but I had never seen it done that way. And I, I knew she was special. Paul and I, <laughs> Paul and I, they finally broke me. I was, I was very, um, theatrical in a sense of my own self-importance. And, and I don't mean that you shouldn't take your job seriously, mm -hmm. but what I meant was is that I wouldn't play a lot. I was very bound to the script. And a lot of the people in the National Touring Company would, pardon the expression, would just fuck around yeah. with the script because we were on the road and they're trying to have fun and find their own way of saying these jokes. And I was very, that's not the text and that's how we do it. The rehearsal went this way and we should never change it. And they broke me of that by trying to get me to laugh on stage. And they finally did get me to break on stage. And I beat myself up so badly for laughing on stage during one scene that we were doing that after the show, I went and I hid in a bathroom. Hmm. <laughs> so they wouldn't be able to enjoy that they had broken me. And they stood outside the door and made fun of me hiding from them. And I realized that I was wrong, that, you know, there's a balance between what they were doing and what I was doing. Yeah. But ultimately they had the right spirit and I was wrong and fucking around was better. Yeah. And so I walked out of that bathroom, a totally different person. Because the script that you had written, right? Your view was you, you want to perform that for the audience as well as you can. You want to, you right. want to be perfect. It wasn't even a script we'd written. This is the national touring company. Right. We're doing a best of show. So this isn't even our material. Who am I to change it? Yeah is my thought. Like that's, that's not professional. But in order to actually be the best version of what you could do, you had to, you had to essentially break the rules. I certainly became a better comedian after they broke me, after they made me break the rules. Hmm. And I'm not sure whether I got better at that scene, but it was better for me as a performer to have done that. And I know some people who never, who are great, who yeah. never broke any of the rules. People you know who were there, who were straight arrows, never changed anything, and they're wonderful. But for me, that's what I needed. I needed to, I needed, I needed a little wildness, you know? I needed to give in to a little bit more of a wild man, which is what those two people are. They're, they're, they're chaotic good. Yeah. They're, they're essentially good people, but they're agents of chaos. Um, when you were a younger man, I mean, you worked around people who are now legendary. You didn't know that at the time. You didn't know that that Amy Sedaris and Paul Dinello and Steve Carell and Chris Farley and 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 Charlie Kaufman and and Louis C.K. All these people that you worked around when you were young would become, you know, who they are today. Was there a sense of competition? I mean, would you ever look at some some of these folks and think, I am never going to be as good as them? I mean, there are aspects of things each one of those people does that I, to this day, know I'll never be as good as. I mean, unless I'm put in some life or death situation and for that <laughs> one moment, I have, God gives me the gift to do something, to do a character as crazy yet as bone deep as Amy. Um, competition, competition with Carell only because he and I would get called in for all the same parts. <laughs> We would constantly, when he would show up to an audition and you see the sign-in sheet and you'd go, oh, <laughs> God damn it. They called Carell in? Well, I'm never going to get this part. And, and you know, he was nice enough to say the same thing about me, like, oh, damn it. And the thing that kind of made both of our careers, which is the Dana Carvey show. Right, which was this show, the, the Dana Carvey show, was, I think it was a short-lived show, a sketch comedy show that you you were worked on with Steve Carell. I mean, Louis C.K. was on, others were on. It was like this legendary cast of characters. Yes. 
we both went through many rounds of of callbacks, but didn't know the other person was being called back until we got to the final callback in Los Angeles. And we saw each other in the hot parking lot where you had to stand to wait to go in. And we both went, oh, damn it. There's no way I'm getting this job. Of course, they're going to hire the other guy. And <laughs> the nice thing is they hired him one day before they hired me. Hmm. So he got to call me and tell me that I had the job. But that's the only person, you know, I wish I had the skills of those people. That's not the same thing as competition. I mean, I, I'd love to be able to perceive things sort of globally and structurally the way Paul does. And Amy Sedaris is, again, this wild, creative character creator. And Farley, I mean, there's mm -hmm. nobody like Farley. There's nobody yeah. like them. There never will be. He's truly once in a lifetime. I never thought I could be Farley. There's no competition. Yeah. I wish I could do it, but that's not the same thing as competition. Yeah. I want to I want to understand sort of the um, the roots of of the the Stephen Colbert character. Right. And, and I know you've talked a little about this, um, but but really it's it's kind of I think it's kind of rooted in this character that you developed with uh, with Amy and Paul for Strangers with Candy, which <laughs> which was the show that the three of you cre uh, sort of co-created. And I, think, I mean, basically, there's this show was like kind of a, a a parody of an after school special show. It was a comedy, obviously, but um, she Amy Sedaris plays a, a troubled forty something who ends up going back to high school, uh, which is a school where, where both you and Paul Danello's character are teachers, um, and your teacher Chuck, uh, he taught history, is kind of a blowhard. I mean, how would how would you describe Chuck? He is a man of moderate intelligence, <laughs> um, enormous insecurity, and no curiosity about his own life. He lives a completely unexamined life. Yeah. And is happy to lie to everyone else and himself about who he is, but all in the attempt to maintain his status as well, to maintain his status, whether yeah. that's as the teacher or as the husband or as the father, it's it's all about uh, keeping a armor around the soap bubble that is his ego. How did you develop that character? How did you come up with that character? I think sometimes, and I can only speak for myself, but sometimes the characters that I've done in the past, whether it's that or other characters, mm -hmm. are a reflection of some part of yourself. And in some ways, they're a confession of some part of yourself that you would otherwise hide. Yeah. And so I, like a lot of people, I suppose, have a great capacity for rewriting reality as soon as it happens in order to recast myself as the hero of that story, or at least to remove myself from any guilt from my own behavior. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to, I have to police myself a lot on that, mm -hmm. especially when I was younger. And so I chose to play an adult who is behaving in a childish way. And I play one of the teachers and Paul was one of the teachers, but all the drama, all the high school drama is between the teachers. It's not really between the kids. And so we, we're making, at least for me, we're making really immature choices. So I thought, you know, that unexamined life of always wanting to maintain your status is a pretty immature choice to make. So I don't know if it was conscious, but that's certainly what I was embodying. That's, I'm trying to serve we're trying to make bad moral choices at all points instead of, you know, because these things teach the correct moral choices. So we're thinking, what if we made all the wrong moral choices at every possible juncture? Where would that lead you? So yeah. I picked a bad part of myself and amplified that. And in the same way, the character, the Colbert mm -hmm. Report was giving into appetites. What would I like if I just gave into my appetites and I didn't care, like if I didn't care mm -hmm. what America was actually like, but rather what would be Amer an America that would work out well for me? It would be if the hegemony of my entire lifetime, which is white, male, Christian, straight, American, yep. that's the last one. If I just 100% leaned into that as America neutral. That's America normal, which you see a lot reflected in cable news, you know, on certain channels. But I thought, what if I embrace that as a virtue? Right. And, and it's not even so much what if I believed that. What if I gave into that natural appetite that how I am should be the only way anyone is? The same way that almost every culture goes, like the name of almost every culture, if you break it down etymologically, it means 
the people. <laughs> and everyone else is maybe not people. In the same way, what if I just gave into that natural right. human fear of anything that's not me? And, 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 and as a result, that ends up being an indictment of the idea of why is that kind of perceived as American neutral? Why am I a hegemonic figure? Why do I enjoy, though I wouldn't have used the term at the time, why do I enjoy the privilege that I do? We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, Stephen Colbert talks about developing and inhabiting the character of Stephen Colbert. I'm Guy Raz. Stay with us. You're listening to The Great Creators. Hey, welcome back to The Great Creators. I'm Guy Raz. There are stories about actors like Ray Fiennes or Marlon Brando that on set, even when the cameras weren't rolling, they'd stay in character. For 10 years, Stephen Colbert stayed more or less in character, a character so far from who he actually is, but with the same exact name. So it wasn't always clear to audiences or the public whether it was real or fake, which is what made the show so good. I mean, at times you 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 were him. You were like it was like Marlon Brando, you know, or 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 Ray Fiennes, you know, (laughs) like being the character. Very similar. Yeah. Very similar. (laughs) But you know, like being that person all the time. Did you? um, Well, being that person all the time, but only when the camera was on. Yeah. That's it. As like literally minutes before the show started, I would, if you had been my guest, I would come back and say, hey, guy, um, you know, I want you to know when I'm out there, uh, he's an idiot. Yeah. And he's willfully ignorant of what you know and care about. Honestly, disabuse me of my ignorance and we'll have a great time. Because my ignorance to you is a useful straw man for you to make your point. But I didn't want to lose. It wasn't a straw man. He was a straw man with a knife in his hand. Right. Or a straw man with his own weaponry. And so I never wanted to lose. And that's what happened when I went into character is that what would distress me sometimes is that I would give the person that warning and I'd still win. (laughs) Yeah, right. And the audience loved it. The audience loved that I won even though I know my audience didn't believe what I was espousing. It just became this elaborate play along game for them. That character was so um, unique, and and the 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 writing, the jokes, the delivery was was remarkable. About that show was there were so many jokes packed into like thirty seconds that that so many of them <laughs> would just pass by. You wouldn't even stop to land those jokes; they would just fly by, right? And and right, and the entire show, and the entire. Well, I'm, I'm glad you noticed that because my first exec, well, a guy named Ben Carlin, mm. for the first few months. He was John's exec, and he would came over to help us start the show. He would come up to the desk after the first act, and he would say, too many jokes. You can't keep this up. And I go, well, so far. <laughs> and it only accelerated as the show went on. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I was watching, um, you know, just a clip recently, and it was the episode that you did about Daft Punk not being able to come onto the show. And there was <laughs> – a moment where wow. you were just – it was just joke after joke and you were talking about how MTV refused to allow them to be on your show first because they're going to go on MTV in a month. And you talked about how you know when once you're on television once, no one ever watches you again, just like the Beatles on Ed Sullivan and then Ringo Starr as a train conductor on Thomas the Tank Engine. It was just <laughs> on and on. And and I, I wondered watching that clip, you know, how, how you could write so – and do that every night. I mean, obviously, there's a team well, working with you, but, but I have you're a fantastic of- team of writers who all understood the game. Not everybody at first. We gave every writer who came on a year to try to get the voice um, because we just we thought they deserve an entire year because it's a difficult thing to write. Yeah. And some of the people got it right away. There's some people who came right out of the gate. My present executive producer, Tom Purcell, um, on day one, wrote three pages of jokes. Every single one of them worked for wow. the character. But some people took a long time. And then I myself could write the character and I could improvise the character. And so 
and we never went up on time. Does that less? That's like, yes, we did a lot of jokes, but I also want to let everybody know we were not particularly professional about it. Like, I think we went up on time 10 times over 1500 shows. And I'm not joking. Wow. We were always late. Cause like, no, that's not exactly how he would say it. And we would rewrite it again. Hmm. And we were always ready for another joke. Can you fit another one in? Is it dumb enough? Can we jam it in there? And we would try. Um, so that just seems normal to me, but I, I hear what you're saying. There were a lot of jokes, but a lot of hard work and a lot of late nights. And yeah. um, in some ways, the performing of it was the easiest part. Getting the voice on script was the hardest. Did you think that that was going to be your career, that that character was who you were going to do for the rest of your professional career because it was so popular. It was such a successful show. No. Or or, or no. was a part of you at a certain point feeling like, I don't know, I, I got to figure something else out. I mean, I was really glad to have found that voice, but I never thought I'd do it forever. I, th I thought, you know, four or five years, something like that. Um, and when I got to year seven, I knew that I was done. Why? I was like, ah, I think I'm done. What 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 was it? Oh, I just kind of, I mean, the phrase that I've used is that I, I thought I'd picked that chicken. Hmm. At this point, I could make soup out of what's left, but I'd played so many different games. We had done so many crazy different things with him. And I still really liked doing it, is the thing. And I thought it would be important to stop while I still really liked doing it. That would be an important thing because sort of proverbially in, especially in late night, proverbially, you know, people who do this job had, get reputations, true or not. They get yeah. reputations from sort of being bitter toward the end. Yeah. And I really, really loved it. And so I didn't tell anybody except my manager, my wife, and my publicist and, and my exec. I said, hey, I'm done on <laughs> December 14th or to December 18th, 2014. That's my last day. And that was two years out. And I started working on the last show in my mind from that moment. Did I think I'd do it forever? No, I did it longer than I thought. Nine years, right? Nine years, a yeah. little, little more than nine years is, is longer than I thought, but I made the decision to leave a couple years before that. You know, I cannot imagine. I'll tell you one thing. There was yeah. one thing I wanted to do that I didn't get a chance to do. I never got a chance to interview a president as the character. And I think something like one or two weeks before the show ended, Obama agreed to sit down oh, for an wow. interview. And I went, okay, truly, now I can really walk away. Right. Because I wanted to ask a president a question I heard Bill O'Reilly ask a president. I heard him ask George Bush this question on the Super Bowl, you know, interview that happens before the mm -hmm. Super Bowl. Like, I don't know why it's become a tradition to talk to the president before the Super Bowl. Right. Bill O'Reilly said to George W. Bush at one point, he said, guys like us. And I went, holy shit. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying you don't have good ratings for like basic cable <laughs> But you just said to the most powerful man in the world, <laughs> guys like us. So I said that, and that was, he did that before I ever did the Colbert Report. And I went, that's the key. He thinks guys like us when he looks at the president, mm -hmm. that self sense of self-importance, high status, poorly informed, you know, well-intentioned, poorly informed, high status idiot. And so I had Obama and I said to him at one point, I said, you know, Guys like us, huge laugh from the audience. And I went, I bet right. I made a bet 10 years ago that that would be a laugh line. And that's, that's when I knew, really knew I could stop. You know, I can't imagine how, I think probably a lot of people assume that the Colbert Report was harder because you were acting in this character. But when I see, when I see you on late night, I can't imagine how much more difficult that job is, incomparably difficult to being that character because you have to – you're you and and you don't have that that guy to lean on. You, you have to be – it's you. We're watching you, the real you. Obviously, obviously the best version of you at that moment, but it's still you. How did you even begin to kind of tackle that in your mind? Like how am I going to do this? <laughs> the funny thing is, is that – so – I get a call, you know, everyone's wondering, Dave steps down, who's going to take over? And my agent calls me and says, it's you. It's you. They want you. And I said, oh, James, I don't know. He goes, what do you mean? I don't know. And I said, 
I just never thought the next thing I would do would be something harder. <laughs> and he goes, yeah. it's not going to be harder. It's going to be easier. <laughs> and John Stewart said the same thing. No, it's going to be easier. They have both apologized <laughs> subsequently. <laughs> because the thing about the old guy was, um, yes, you had the mask of him. Yeah. Which not only protects you from criticism because no that was him um but there's also the benefit of because of the character's worldview everything's a joke even the choices of what he decides to talk about is somehow a joke and so there's a base coat of comedy going on before i ever open my mouth before right. we ever get to one of the written jokes just looking at you you're already funny yeah, there's an attitudinal comedy there. And so you start off with funny and you build on top of it. Now, that's a hard thing to sustain, and I'm a huge fan of me. So I'm not going to say it wasn't a bit of a triple gainer to do. But here, yeah, I had never done this before. As I said before, like the reason I respect stand-up is I never – I never put in those years yeah. on the road. I never just stood out there and said, here's a joke. How do you like that? <laughs> because when you don't have that base code of character, well, then everything is a joke. Right. And if you don't have the mask, you're responsible for everything that you say. And it took me a while to actually hear as the words came out of my mouth that I was still actually a little in character. I hadn't dropped the old guy. Not that I was playing the overt nature of the character, but I was still in the satirical form where I'm not meaning what I'm saying. Yeah. Which an audience not ready for that is not perceiving as a joke. They just don't like it. And giving in to me being enough on stage that a lot of the job is the audience just hanging out with you and just liking you was a very difficult thing for a guy who, as you said, could not jam enough jokes into a single sentence to satisfy his own appetite for it. <laughs> uh, some of the loveliest moments on the show have nothing to do with comedy. Yeah. It's just, it's just talking. Yeah. I mean, you went from this wildly successful show on Comedy Central to a massive national stage platform, pressure, CBS, history, David yeah. Letterman. I mean, you know, that studio and um, and the first six months were, were tough. I mean, you, you know, the show sure. and, and, and it must have been stressful. I, I, oh, very, very stressful. What was going on inside of your head at that time? I mean, did you think this isn't going to work? I, I'm not going to make this work. No, it wasn't. I'm not going to make this work. It's I don't know how we're going to get there hmm. because there was an endless amount of effort put into it. You know, I'm a big fan of working. I think unrewarded talent is proverbial is what it said at my theater school at Northwestern. There was a poster that said unrewarded talent is proverbial. There is no substitute for work. And so we worked like stevedores. Yeah. I mean, we were kind of killing ourselves trying to figure out how to ask ourselves the question of, well, what do we want to do? As Tom Purcell, again, my exec, likes to say, we got a big old laser here. Yeah. Our problem is often, how do we focus it? What do we actually want to point it at? And we were also getting a lot of very well-intentioned advice, which we made the mistake of taking and eventually discarded all of it and just did what we wanted, which was to talk about what's happening today. And it was a strange, go around your elbow to find your ass. When we actually landed on it about six months in, and it, and it happened because when Chris Licht came in, my old um, showrunner, mm -hmm. who's now run CNN, CNN yeah. he, he said, I'm just gonna take everything away from you that isn't you and Tom thinking about comedy. What do you wanna talk about today? And then we immediately landed on the show you see now. Yeah. Because we were trying to run the show at the same time. And while we ran the old show, that was like running a college newspaper compared to running a network nightly 1130 show. There's the mechanics of a lot of unions, network pressure, advertisers, yeah. different yeah. timings, an hour versus a half hour. Uh, ratings being a real thing. 
as opposed to a pleasant thing to discuss sometimes. All of that, we suddenly didn't have to think about. We only thought about what's the kind of show we want to do. And it became clear very quickly, sort of related to the old character, we gave into our appetites. What actually interests us? You know, it's interesting because you tell the story about being on stage with Amy Sedaris and Paul Dinello and them kind of, you know, kicking you off kilter and, and making you laugh and kind of you feeling like you ruined that moment because you didn't read the script as it was meant to be. But that actually allowed you to become the the writer and the comedian that you became. And I, yeah. I wonder whether there's a version of that happening in, in 2015, 2016, which is you allowed yourself to not be funny all the time. And to allow your emotional, like, you know, kind of interior monologue or whatever might be going on to drive that creativity, to allow you to just be who you really needed to be. I think you've got something there because the sort of the, the thing they leave out of that Paul and Amy mocking me outside the bathroom door, you know, knowing that I'm kicking myself inside is that before I came out, I felt I, I felt like something broke inside of me, like hmm. physically broke inside of me. And it was painful. It, it, it was kind of agonizing to give into it. But I knew that there was no other way, that, that all my resistance somehow was associated with fear. And, and then I came out of that room a, a new guy, but uh, it wasn't an unpainful process. In the same way, I remember on the first anniversary of the show, which would be September 8th or first week of September 2016, I'm getting ready to do the show. I'm basically putting on my tie and everything, looking in the mirror. And I thought, man, whew, that first year was really hard. <laughs> like that was, I mean, that was at times that was just agonizing. And then I realized that I was grateful for it. A, happy to be through it. Because at that point, a year in, I knew we had found it. We found it, we found it by the beginning of the summer. Now we're like four months in. Yeah. And people haven't noticed yet that we found it. We got some good notices for live coverage of the conventions, but the audiences hadn't come back yet. Right. But I knew we had it. And I remember looking in the mirror going, is that crazy? I'm actually grateful for how painful that year was. And then I looked in the mirror and I went, you dummy. Why did you think at the age 50, you could change your style and it wouldn't be painful? What made you think you could do a change that big and it wouldn't be <laughs> agonizing? How dumb are you? Like how little wisdom do you have that you think that kind of change comes without a price? And that first year, especially those first six months, that was the price. And I had to do it with a camera pointed at me. Coming up after a quick break, world events collide and force Stephen Colbert to remake his on-camera character all over again. Stay with us. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to The Great Creators. Hey, welcome back to The Great Creators. In 2020, five years into Stephen Colbert's time behind the desk at The Late Show, the COVID pandemic hit. After a brief hiatus, he started hosting the show from his home in Charleston, South Carolina. And in that setting, and with everything happening in the world, Stephen's presence on camera shifted once again. It became more intimate. And in more and more interviews, he became, in a sense, a grief counselor. I've read that that you, you know, this is, I mean, it's who you are. It's who you've always been. But it's something that the audiences didn't really see until the last two or three years. You know, my character didn't have that history. Right. You know, so there was no reason for that. And it was important that I not give in to... non-comedic impulses. I don't know how to describe it. I remember I guest hosted The Daily Show. Craig Kilborn had said something absolutely terrible and unforgivable in Esquire magazine 
about yeah. one of the producers. Yes. And he was yanked off the air for a week. Right. And I was a new guy. I'd been there for a couple months. And they said, you're hosting tonight. I'm like, okay. And I was about to go on stage. And Chris Farley died. Mm. And I was... I was standing up in the executive producer's office, Madeline Smithberg, and in comes one of the associate producers. And she comes in and no one has any idea that I know Chris. Hmm. And she comes in kind of excitedly because it's a big story. Yeah. And she goes, Chris Farley died like that. Hmm. And I fell to the ground. Wow. And everybody laughed. They thought it was a bit. Hmm. And then they figured out it wasn't a bit. And the room cleared out. And then after a few phone calls to a few friends, my producer said, can you go on? I said, yes, I can go on. She goes, do you want to say anything about Chris at the end of the show? And I said, nope, that's a, it's not my show. And B that's not the context of the show. There was no room for that level of sincerity. So it didn't fit that context didn't fit in the Colbert report either. And so there was yeah. no room for you to see that aspect of me or to re reveal that part of me. The first time it went beyond, we've got the comedy down, or we've got the form down, or we've got our, our function down, literally our process, all of that, once that was all worked out, well, that's all well and good. But it didn't reach another level until I was raw in my revelation of myself, to like really be myself. And that was the night that Trump was elected. Yeah. Because we had an hour special, the camera could not cut away from me is live on Showtime, there's no commercials, it's just me and the camera, and yes, but me. And when he won, there was no escaping from the absolute shock and horror with just a, a hint of hope yeah. that the American people made this choice out of what they thought was best for them and not as a punishment to each other. And the last 10 minutes of the show are largely improvised. Yeah. There was something in the prompter. But the VIP of that night was my prompter operator, Michelle Decker, because she was like going all over the place going, is he going here? Is he going here? Because I just told how I felt and told stories and right. things I'd learned from my mother and how I perceived this moment, knowing that somewhere at the end of this, there's a joke or a, a destination. And that 10 minutes... When it was over, Chris came over to me. I left the stage. I went backstage, went up against the back wall of the Ed Sullivan, literally put my hands on the bricks for a second to try to calm down. And he said, are you okay? And I said, yes. And he said, that was completely raw. Did you just make all that up? <laughs> I said, yes. And that's how I feel. And I said, and now I know how to do the show <laughs> because up until this point, however well we did it, my emotional skegs weren't in the water. I was hydroplaning all the time. And now I got to make sure that we never get those skegs out of the water again. That it's not a confession, you know, yeah. this isn't therapy, but I have to have some emotional honesty, even if it's a percentage of the reality of how I feel. 25%. It just can't be false. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it it speaks to this idea that that you you made this remarkable shift you you challenged yourself you know at at 50 it's not old i mean i'm i'm a, you know I'm no it is old that's funny that's one of the things i want to talk about it is old no one gets one of these jobs this old <laughs> i mean i got the colbert report which you might say is like you know it, i'm very proud of it and it's yeah. it's a it's a, it's its own thing and has a beginning middle and end but that at 41 yeah and that's old for that right. i mean everybody else who gets one of these jobs is in their early 30s yeah or even younger when you get one of these gigs. And I didn't start here. I was actually 51 when the show started. Got it when I was 50. Started when I was 51, knowing that that's old. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, it's fun to have learned a new school skill at this to, age. To it's it's like making it's like yeah. making friends at this age. It's yeah. hard to make new friends it in is. your fifties. It's hard to learn a whole new skill in your fifties. Yeah, totally. And that first agonizing year was the only way I could have done it. Gun to my head. Um, it seems to me that you are want to get better and better at what you do every day, and you kind of have to because it's like a driving force, right? It's like this propulsive thing. How do you? How do you do that? How do you get better as an interviewer? How do you get better as a presence, as a um, as a, as a writer, as a comedian? That's a very hard one to answer in terms of like as a writer or a comedian, mm-hmm. because it's not always the case. You know, you do your best. Last night was a really good show. I, I think on average we put in a good effort. We care. We care every day. We don't ever phone it in, but. Whether or not we're getting better is in some ways up to the audience. I suppose never stop caring. Always show up to rehearsal. Try to remember those things that I learned through improvisation, which is yes and. If someone pitches me an idea, try to add to their idea before you discard it. Because as you add to it, you might discover what their intention was. And then you might discover something together that's better than anything you can invent together. Discovery being superior to your invention. Invention comes out of you. Discovery mm-hmm. comes from I know not where. And it's usually something like a little act of love between you and the other person you're writing with. And the love is the love of the joke. Yeah. And and then it bleeds. You do that enough and then you love each other. So it's just continuing to care, I guess. But in terms of like interviewing people, that was forced upon me. I, I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know how to breakthrough. I had a very good way of doing things on the old show because I was the guest. Yeah. They just got to witness it. Right. And I, you know, I live by Joe Scarborough's rule, which is if your guest speaks for more than seven seconds, you've lost control of your show. And so I would just barrage them with jokes that I had that would occur to me as they spoke. And that was the game. But to actually sit and listen to someone and then be in some ways affected intellectually, or emotionally about what they're doing and then follow that up in real time with 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 real interest, hopefully, in what they're talking about, because that's not always the case, but hopefully that took me a long time and COVID did it did it to me. Yeah. So I'm four years in, something like that. I'm four years into the show and doing a fine show, but I get to COVID and suddenly it's just me and them with no audience and no one else in the room mostly, just you and me like this. Yeah. And I would start the interviews They'd come up on the Zoom window and I'd say, hey, you know, hey, Chris, what's going on? And we would start a conversation. And then 10 minutes later, I'd say, thanks so much for being here. And they would say, wait, that was it? And I would say, yeah, I just I just wanted it to be a conversation. And so a lot of those early interviews changed how I approached by having, it's not like I didn't have a plan. I still had a card, but there was no moment of starting the performative quality of interviews. Yeah. And that changed. I had to stop doing that because because some guests didn't like that. They wanted that performative uh, starting gun, which I can totally understand. So yeah, we we would tell them that that's how it would start it. That as soon as he starts talking, you're on the air essentially. Um, but for me, it it opened up the possibility that me simply being present with a guest and being interested in whatever they're talking about was sufficient. And it's not like I don't go in with six questions that I want to ask, but I'm mostly trying to have moments of discovery with them. And it's much more enjoyable for me, and it's much more casual, and it's much more like hanging out. Yeah. And with an audience now, there's undeniably a performative aspect of it because, you know, observation changes the observed. Yeah. But it's much closer to what I had hoped this would be. That's Stephen Colbert host of The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. There's at least one more iteration of the Stephen Colbert name, and it's in space. On the International Space Station, there is a treadmill called Colbert. This happened after Colbert Report fans won Stephen a naming competition that NASA was holding. And of course, since this is NASA, Colbert is also an acronym for the Combined Operational Load-Bearing External Resistance Treadmill.
Hey, thanks so much for listening to the show this week. And if you like what you heard, we have one small request. Please tell someone about it. Share a link or a tweet or post a story and hashtag The Great Creators. You can find us on social media by searching The Great Creators. We're on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and I'm on TikTok as Guy Raz. So please spread the word. And thanks. This episode was produced by Bruce Wallace and edited by Andrea Bruce with help from Jeff Rogers. Thanks also to Kevin Leahy, Elaine Coates, Jenna Gedman, Nat Hoops, Michael May, Marita Murphy, and Michelle Triant. I'm Guy Raz, and you've been listening to The Great Creators from Built It Productions.